Just one announcement before we get started. We have a new webinar open for registration. Skeleton Key, Jungian Psychology as Experience, with Boris Matthews, PhD, LCSW, and Jungian Analyst, on Friday, May 7th, 2021, from 1 to 4 p.m. Central Time. To learn more about that webinar, just visit our website, youngchicago.org. Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. The Return of the Archetypal Feminine and the Dawn of the New Third with Lorraine Kurisco, Ph.D. Jungian Analyst. For this Women's History Month, we're sharing this seminar in its entirety. From the seminar description, the archetypal feminine is back and she's unhappy. From Me Too to the trial of Larry Nasser to the rising refusal of young adults to be defined as either male or female, opting instead for the more neutral pronoun they, evidence of of profound change is all around us. Neumann and Whitman tell us that consciousness can be conceived as having evolved through stages, beginning with the archetypal Great Mother. Several thousand years ago, this feminine consciousness was repressed in the service of the development of masculine eco-consciousness, which has, for better and worse, been accomplished. We now have considerable eco-strength, but no connection to anything beyond it. Hence, a good deal of turmoil in a world that feels untethered, without purpose or direction. Both feminine and masculine-dominated cultures were necessarily one-sided, otherwise each could not have developed. But what is next? and what is required of us so that the new third can emerge. This seminar dives deeply into the bigger story at play here, the deep archetypal dynamics and the wisdom behind them. We begin to think about, observe, and imagine the next phase of consciousness. Rather than simply enacting each stage via identification, we can step back and consciously embrace the gifts and costs of each for men and women. By holding both in a conscious, creative tension of opposites, we can facilitate the emergence of the mercurial divine child. Lorraine Carisco received her PhD in clinical depth psychology from the Pacifica Graduate Institute in 2000 and diplomate Jungian analyst from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago in 2016. Prior to beginning analyst training in Chicago, she attended the Minnesota Seminar on Jungian Studies for nine years and the Philadelphia Seminar in Jungian Studies for one year. She has worked as a psychologist since 1987 and is currently in private practice in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. A Canadian by birth, she and her family enjoy their annual pilgrimage to their cottage near Salt St. Marie, Canada, on the shores of Lake Superior. Last episode, I shared a form and a request for people to fill it out and share something about themselves. And so over the course of the next several episodes, uh, I'll share those, perhaps just a few each episode. To begin, I should say a little bit about myself. Uh, My name is Ben Law, and I'm the Creative Services Manager at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago and the executive producer of the podcast. I have a background in psychology and also in dance performance and I'm a Feldman Christ practitioner in addition to helping run the Institute. Tessa from Brisbane, Australia says, I'm a clinical psychologist, 12 years in private practice. I love depth psychology and I'm training in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, but it's a second choice to Jungian studies, which isn't offered in my country. Steve from Garrison, New York says, been in Jungian analysis for 16 years and have worked as a chaplain. Tamana uh, from Brighton, from Brighton, England. 
My Jungian psychology interest started when I started reading Japanese Jungian founder Hayao Kawai's books. I was very fascinated by the fact that fairy tales and mythologies hold a very important part in our psyche and just by reading his books. I felt like I learned so much from psychology to anthology, literature, history, and art, and more. Originally, I am from Japan, and I have been living in England since 2003. I started reading English Jungian and Jung's materials about five years ago, and I am always hungry for Jungian knowledge. I am a jeweler and enjoy listening to podcasts while I am working. That's how I discovered your podcast. I listened to all of your episodes and discovered so many great Jungians that you have uploaded in the past. I have been in Jungian analysis for the last two years, and it has been a great personal journey. My life is somehow leading to becoming a Jungian analyst, and my first step on this journey will happen in late April this year. Uh, Omedetou gozaimasu. Congratulations. Thank you very much for providing an amazing podcast. When a new episode turns up in my phone, it always gives me a big smile on my face. Great. We're happy that we can supply that. So thanks to everyone who has submitted, and I'll read some more next time. And if anyone else wants to submit uh, something about themselves on the podcast, you can just click the link in the show notes. I'll leave it in each episode from now going forward. So now here's the lecture. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It's a good turnout. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, so um, I just want to start with a few comments, and then we'll, we'll get going. It's, uh, I haven't done this talk before, and there's a lot of material to get through, so we'll try to take a break roughly halfway through for a little bit. Um, so this is a topic that I have been probably stewing on for most of my life and it just keeps calling me back so when I signed up to do this talk I didn't really know what I would say precisely but when I sign up to do a talk like this this whole process starts and and things start coming to me and it just evolves and that happened again this time and um, I feel like I learned a lot from doing this so I'm hoping that you learn so you're able to learn something from it as well the original title had goddess in it and that wasn't my idea it was someone else's suggestion and um I didn't like the word goddess, and I wasn't sure why until later. But the reason is it genderizes God, which brings us right to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so we removed that, and we, and I switched it to the archetypal feminine, which I felt much better about. Uh, so... I hope I don't step on anybody's toes today, but we're going to get into some material that's pretty laden with uh, complex and has been for thousands of years. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm welcome. I welcome any of your questions or comments or uh, disagreements, and I hope that we can get a lively discussion going here and try to move this forward a little bit further. Okay, so. <coughs> okay, um, so just a little bit of an outline where we're going to go here. First of all, what is the archetypal feminine? I mean, do any of us really have a, a clear sense of what that is, or the archetypal masculine for that matter? Um, We're going to look at where we are and what's going on in the collective right now, because that's that's part of what brought this to my attention now, um, is there's just a lot of stuff going on out there that, that seem to be pointing toward this topic and, and calling me toward it. Um, so we're going to look at kind of what's going on out there, and then we'll look at... Uh, a bit of history, the last 6,000 years, and and what that's about. You know, why why has patriarchy been such a powerful force for 6,000 years? And I don't believe it's just about men behaving badly or anything like that. There's something really important going on in this. And so we'll have a look at that. Talk about the evolution of consciousness um, and the parallels in neurological, psychological, and social development. And I think um, 
we'll spend a good amount of time on trying to separate gender from the archetypal masculine and feminine because I think those have been confused. And then we're going to look at where we could go, I think, from here if we can become psychological enough. So um, four people that are kind of the um, four horsemen of my positive father complex, I suppose. Um, Edward Whitmont is one of them. Uh, Edward Edinger, uh, Eric Neumann, um, and Joseph Chilton Pierce. Are, are, so I'll be bringing them into the conversation today. So this is a quote by Edward Whitmont in his book, The Return of the Goddess. Collectively, we're in an existential deadlock of estrangement from nature and from ourselves. However, this cultural end phase, with all its decadence, is not exclusively negative. It heralds the beginning of a new phase as well. I think that's where we're at. Okay, so what is going on out there? Nature's in turmoil. Catholic Church, we've had the sex abuse crisis. Um, traditional religions are not holding a lot of, um, they, they're not sustaining people anymore. We have Trump and Trump's wall, which to me is a really good image of primitive ego defenses that do not discern what to allow in, what to you know, what could be beneficial to us, to them, what's humanitarian. There's no discernment with a wall. Mass shootings, bombings, nuclear threats, suicides, homicides, um, the whole Me Too movement. I've had clients, men, who say things like, I'm afraid to be a man right now. I'm afraid as a doctor to put a hand on a woman's shoulder that I could be, all she has to do is say rape and I'm, I could be sent to jail. So uh, men are fearful, women are angry because there's been, there has been abuse going on for a long time. Um, and it's a, a time of accountability to some degree. Um, the Kavanaugh Blasey Ford thing that I think we all followed fairly closely and had me shaking my head many times, thinking, what is going on here? Larry Nassar, I've been involved in that case with the gymnasts who were abused. 493 have come forward to this point. This went on for 20 years, and nobody believed these girls. So what's going on there? Gen X, 20 and, 20 and 30 year olds, they're, um, they're having less sex than, than anybody has ever had. <laughs> um, even married people uh, are not having sex as much as they used to. Um, they, the Gen Xers feel lost, like they've inherited quite a mess from the boomers. The values that the boomers held don't hold for them anymore, and yet they don't, they don't know where to go from here. The, the new thing hasn't come in yet. They're still kind of on the skirt tails of the old, the old thing. The rise of science, rationalism, objective evidence-based as the only legitimate research, and hopefully a, a rising movement toward revaluing the subjective. I think we see glimmers of that, but it's still not mainstream. Quantum physics is challenging our assumptions about reality, but that too has not hit the mainstream yet. The rise of they, instead of identifying as I'm male or I'm female, um, he, she, going, people going by they, like it's like a rejection of gender altogether and a refusal to buy into these heavily laden um, gender identities that come with social roles and prescriptions and, um, you know, what that means. So um, I, I kind of applaud that. And I think in a way it's paving the way for us to see that gender has never been uh, a binary like we've accepted it to be. It's not that clear and straightforward. Germany on last Friday declared an official third gender 
called Diver, I think for <coughs> diversity, but I'm not sure. Um, we've seen an increase in terminology um, for various genders, um, gender neutral, pan-gender, transgender. Um, there's all the different designations with fine gradations of difference between them. Facebook has three gender options, male, female, and custom. And if you click on custom, there's a drop-down menu with alphabetized, I mean, <laughs> many, many choices to choose from there. So the whole gender notion is broadening. And, you know, in alchemy as above, so below, we have to wonder what that is, what that's showing us, what that means about the deeper story that's going on. <clears throat> so, okay, my call to this topic, I just want to kind of briefly touch on, was I remember when I realized that gender inequality was a thing. I didn't know until I was a teenager that that was even a thing, and I was outraged. I was incensed. And that, you know, where are the, the women in politics and unequal pay and a male god and the church is run by only men women are not allowed and no vote like, what what's what's going on so so it's always been i've always felt like we've gone off the rails and i don't think we even maybe we know we've gone off the rails but we have no idea how to right this this ship so um mixing my metaphors there but you know what i mean so I guess that's what I've been trying to, to get at for a very long time. Jung's theory of the anima and animus were um, interesting to me, but also uh, very problematic. They really didn't speak to my experience of myself as a female with this, this masculine inner other um, and so we'll, I'll go into the, some of the problems with that theory later. Some people have suggested that masculine and feminine should just be thrown out altogether because they're so, so laden and complex. But I don't think we can. I think they're too big and too important that they can't be thrown out. We have to grapple with them and we have to understand what is the deeper story that's going on before we can free ourselves from just acting out what we've been acting out for a long time. Um, yeah, cisgender is, a, is another term now that um, that's when you identify with the um, gender that you were assigned at birth. I mean, when I was growing up, it, <laughs> that didn't exist as a term. It was just something that, that everybody kind of did. So anyway, it's... Uh, it's, there's a lot of developments around gender. So gradually, I think with, with reading and, and thinking, and I started to see the relationship between gender and the archetypes of masculine and feminine were only loosely connected at best. In fact, I don't think there are any traits that one can say are gender specific. Can anybody think of any? So then what are masculine and feminine? And how or why have we ended up in the situation where men and masculine values, patriarchy, have dominated most of the earth for about 6,000 years? What's the psychological meaning in this? Jung on masculine and feminine. So there were pros and cons. It was problematic, but it did move the discussion forward. He saw gender largely, gender identity determined largely by anatomy. He recognized an inner contrasexual other but tended to see it as inferior. Basically, men should act like men and women should act like women, whatever that means. 
and that assumes a clarity that we no longer can assume, and it confuses gender and archetype. He talked about animus possession, so a woman who maybe um, had a strong thinking function or um, was theoretical might be described as animus possessed or if she had a, a, an opinion about something. <laughs> <clears throat> so, and then she might be manly or... Um, so it, it kind of pigeonholes her and, and it restricts her. And I think the same is true for men. I think men have been limited too by, you know, not being girly or, you know, um, overly sensitive because then they were called anima possessed. So Jung started with the theory of a man's psyche because he was male, and I'm sure he felt he understood that better. And then I think he tried to work back from that and deduce what a woman's must be, kind of an opposite to what a man's is. And so then we got into problems like, well, if the anima is a man's soul image, then does a woman have a soul? (laughs) And I remember reading that and just shaking my head and just being... In sense. And, and Freud asked the famous question, what does a woman want? Like it's this big profound question. And then he came to the conclusion that it must be to serve men. <laughs> this was the genius of Freud. Well, not one of his finer moments. He did have some good moments, but that wasn't one of them. So... Um, positives in Jung's theory of masculine and feminine. He, he did clearly value the archetypal feminine as soul, as image, as relationship, as feeling, as experiencing, as the non-rational nature, um, dynamic oneness of unity and differentiation um, that allow for things like synchronicity. The problem is um, those are still... Uh, genderizing things that are universal to men and women and and any gender. So it's still problematic, but I think he tried to make room for his own feminine side. And, And part of why he was demonized was because he did that, because he didn't subscribe to a more patriarchal... Um you know, science as Freud would have liked him to, which was more patriarchal. Um, He didn't play by the rules of the masculine archetype, you could say. And um, I think he was too whole for that. I think he had too much integration of his own feminine to play by those rules and divide himself in that way. So um, he introduced the idea that we are all both masculine and feminine, biologically and psychologically. Um, but I think it needed to be taken another step further. He brought these overarching archetypes into consciousness as something for us to grapple with, even if imperfectly. So trying to identify particular traits as masculine or feminine has been problematic. Um, any any trait really to genderize it is 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 limiting courage tenderness compassion soul i mean how can we how can we genderize any of those right we we all need them so uh this quote is by jung and it's it's an example of how um how things are muddled in terms of gender and archetype. The anima is an autonomous, unconscious principle identifiable with the affective side of the masculine psyche and the archetype of all the experiences of man with woman. So there we have how men interact with with women and we have the, the affect being associated with Uh, feminine. The term logos is preferred to that of animus in defining the clarity of consciousness and rationality of the masculine psyche. In discussing the psychology of women, the term animus is retained to indicate the quasi-intellectual factor in the feminine psyche consisting of inferior judgments or opinions. 
Animus is seen as an inferior logos, just as anima is best described as an inferior eros. And so it pigeonholes all of us that we're somehow predefined as what we're, what we're supposed to be or what we are. Like women can't be genuinely intellectual or men can't be genuinely feeling. Logos and Eros. Logos has traditionally been defined as differentiation, clarification, discrimination, and detachment. Eros, interweaving and relatedness. Um, I think that's kind of an attempt to de-genderize it, but it still carries a genderized um, connotation. And we all need all of these. And are men necessarily better at Logos than women? I, I don't think so. Are women necessarily better at Eros than men? I, I don't think so. I often have clients say their father was the more nurturant one in the family. He was the one that they went to, and he was the one that held the family together. So these logo skills might be better understood as the achievements of the emerging ego consciousness. More related to left hemisphere cortical development and I think the uh, evolutionary task of the past 6,000 years of patriarchy. I think this is what we've been trying to do is develop an ego and I'll, I'll try to um, show what I, what I mean, how I came to that. So the, the arrow skills would predate the logos development and um, neurologically that makes sense in terms of um, the evolution of the brain from reptilian to um, the mammalian limbic system and then the neocortical more left hemisphere and then the prefrontal cortex as the, the really the most recent achievement for humans. Three stages of development um, in Eric Neumann's The Origins and History of Consciousness. He outlines the evolution of consciousness from the matriarchal to the patriarchal, individually and collectively, but he doesn't go into a third phase. So Edward Whitmont then came along and wrote The Return of the Feminine, and this was his attempt to carry Neumann's book into the next phase. And it, that's a very good book that, that I recommend. And Whitmont calls the three phases the magical, the mythological, and the mental. He, which I'll get into, he connects our psychological evolution with McLean's outline of uh, human brain development, the triune brain, from the reptilian, which is concerned with adaptation and survival, the, the uh, autonomous, uh, autonomic system, to the mammalian brain, which is, um, they're, they're all sort of new layers built on the earlier layers, and the earlier layers are still there, but with each new addition, they're, they're changed in, in a way in terms of how they're used. But the limbic system does connect more with the right, and the cortical system connects more with the left, and, and then the, um, the prefrontal cortex that has come along, I think in, the, in about the last 40,000 years, is right at the hub. So you know how the Egyptians always have pictures of a serpent coming out of the forehead? Mm -hmm. Whitmont suggests that that's a... No, no, Joseph Chilton Pierce suggests that's probably an image of the prefrontal cortex. Um, <laughs> because it sits right at the hub of all of these earlier brain structures and um, it essentially unifies all of them to create a whole new entity that's much more coherent and, and then we're able to think about what we feel and, and process things all around. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea that ontogeny recapit recapitulates phylogeny is the idea that the development of the individual parallels that of the species. So in evolution, we had reptiles and then mammals and then humans, and we're still evolving. 
In infant development, a similar process unfolds from brainstem to limbic to cortex. In utero, the right hemisphere develops first. We lay down implicit patterns that influence us unconsciously throughout life in those first two or three years. Infants are largely right hemisphere dominant until they're about two or three when the left hemisphere begins to operate and we start to develop our ego consciousness and uh, establish a sense of I as a separate person. So that's where the individual ego comes on board and then we have to look at in terms of human development when... um, when humans really started to identify themselves as I. So in the beginning, we're virtually inseparable from our mothers regarding our identities. This corresponds to Neumann's great mother phase of human development and matriarchy. And nobody really knows if matriarchy ever really existed. I mean, there have been goddess figures that have been found, but... um, those societies were probably very different than um, if we think about what patriarchy is now and then we think, well, matriarchy must have been when women were rulers. It probably wasn't like that at all. It was probably more egalitarian. But we'll get to that. I keep getting ahead of myself. As we continue to develop into our teens and early adulthood, we shift our focus from our mothers from whom we must separate in order to develop our own identity toward our fathers, whose task is to help us go out into the world and and make our way. And I often tell fathers that, you know, you get progressively important as your kids get older. And by the time they're teens, they really need you in early 20s, you know, to to help them to get out there and, and separate from their mom and find their way, shed their mother complexes. And this is true for, for males and female children, that they, this process, they need to separate from their mothers and they need, to, they need their fathers to help them out into the world. So Joseph Chilton Pierce says that the, this prefrontal cortex, so what happens is if the earlier structures all develop adequately, meaning there hasn't been so much trauma that, they've been, that development has been disrupted, then the prefrontal cortex, which is the newest and the most fragile development, begins uh, a, a, a whole new phase of unifying these other parts. And this goes on into our mid to late 20s, maybe even 30s, mid 30s, that the brain is you know, reconfiguring itself, and we know that our brains reconfigure themselves throughout life. Um, so and then this Dan Siegel also talks about this that then this allows more of a whole brain functioning and and a coherence and Dan Siegel says that the more coherent our narrative is of our life the more coherent our brain is so one of the ways of bringing your brain into more coherence is to to write your narrative and to to unify thinking and feeling and intuition and sensation and um you know thinking about feelings that we've experienced and, and traumas, and then we're, we're reconnecting everything in a new way. And I think Jesus might be one of the best images that we have of this potential, um, potentially very coherent brain that evolution is trying to create. And then with trauma... It goes in a kind of a reverse order. So when, when there's trauma, the, the first thing to go is, is this potential coherence of, of the whole brain. Next to go is often the capacity to think in a differentiated way that is separate from affect and the limbic system. Uh, next to go is affect. You get a, a flattening uh, affectively and then finally we can be kept alive with just the autonomous brainstem for for a long time and um, that's been around the longest and it's the most stable of, of all of the systems so the magical phase Whitmont's three phases the first is the magical phase so in this phase and so be, we're thinking also of human development and individual, uh, an infant. 
preverbal, unitary symbiotic identity level of existence or consciousness prior to the arising of mythological imagery or rational thought. Babies don't care about fairy tales yet. None of that. Um, it's only They're only here and now. Um, past, present, and future don't yet exist conceptually. Uh, neither does really within and without. There's a kind of fusion with the mother. Body, mind, psyche, they're all kind of joined together. Self and other. Um, and so the, these early cultures... Um, Whitmont uses the term uh, gynolatric as opposed to matriarchal because matriarchal seems to suggest um, that as a society it's ruled by females where gynolactic, gynolactric is more of a psychological term that says the um, archetypal feminine values were, were va- very valued. They were dominant values. So there was a magical oneness in that phase. And you can see that we still have remnants of that phase. In fact, I did my thesis here on why we still believe in magic, because we still have the, the, the early brain. And at the, in, the level, in that level of reality, magic does happen. Everything is interconnected. And so synchronicity and, you know, how many of us touch wood still or... Don't do things that we're afraid might jinx us, or um, you know, it, it's still there. It's kind of beneath the surface, but it is still there if you just scrape a little bit under. So this gynolactric period probably went from the Stone Age, um, and which went on for I think millions of years, and then ended between 8700 to 2000 BC. So. 10 to 4,000 years ago and went into the Bronze Age, which ended probably about uh, 3,000 years ago. Mythologically, um, creation myths portray this phase as the Garden of Eden, Paradise, the Great Round, before we knew we were naked or felt shame because there was no ego yet to feel shame. Um, so, and in terms of these these early cultures, they they were not probably ruled by females, but um, the evidence is that men and women really work together, especially nomadic cultures. Um, there's no evidence of hierarchies or a center of power. Um, the good of the collective is paramount. It's not so much about individuals because there's not that level of ego development yet really as separate individuals there's evidence that the children were, children were probably raised communally um, because they found that when um, they find bodies buried underneath homes they're not just genetic so it suggests that they uh, it was more of a clan base than a genetic family base like we have now and associated with these cultures are the kind of corpulent mother goddess um, uh, figures that have been found. If you're interested in more about that topic, there's a really good show, I think it's on either Netflix or Amazon Prime, called The Ascent of Woman. And it's a 90-minute documentary, and she really goes through the, the last 10,000 years. Could you repeat yeah, person who did that. I can't remember her name. Just look up the Ascent of Woman, and it's it's researched and narrated by a woman who really did her homework. It's it's very very good. And in that film, she talks about uh, in Hedwina. Let me find this for you. Um, oh, that was it. Okay, the first eye. Um, An Edwina, this was a, a woman, uh, 2285 to 2250 BC. She was a Sumerian poet 
and she apparently wrote the first literary masterwork. So this is about 4,000 years ago, and she's the first person that we know to have referred to, to themselves as I. She said, I, she wrote in a clay tablet, I am an Hidwana. And she was very powerful. Her father was King Sargon the Great, and she was appointed to the highest religious appointment at the time. And men and women were equal under her, but soon after that, patriarchy really took over. And Patriarchy took over at different places in different times, but it pretty much took over almost everywhere eventually. So the way that the ego emerges is out of the unconscious. It emerges as a sense of, I am this, not that. And so it's this separation into two-ness process. It emerges in identification with what we like and aspire to, and the rejected, devalued parts are split off and repressed, creating the shadow, which is then projected, resulting in scapegoating, <coughs> wars, isms, uh, by definition, neurosis, right? When we take opposites and we identify with one and reject the other, that's classic definition of neurosis. The fact that both halves are part of one cyclic reality is forgotten. And this needs to be remembered in the next phase, brought back together. To the emerging rational patriarchal consciousness, the abysmal, chaotic, threatening mystery of the unconscious is deemed evil, and it has then been projected onto women. We always value what's newest most, and I think it has been our... Um, the, the rising, the birth of the ego has been our evolutionary task for, for quite some time. And the splitting that that required, um, I think, got projected onto men and women, where men became identified with ego <coughs> qualities, and women got left with the dregs, so to speak, of the unconscious. Um, and... When you think about, so the ego emerges, think about, I, I just use this image all the time because to me it's, it's useful. You think about a little fish jumping out of the water. This is the ego emerging out of the unconscious. You know, first it was in the water, it didn't know the water because it was in it, and it can't know it until it separates. But at first, you know, it's, it's fragile, and it's in danger of just falling back in, and so it needs a lot of ego defenses to be able to move forward. And so it really has to sort of, it, it forgets where it came from, it wants nothing to do with that, it's just focused on its own survival. And that's a big part of what, what the ego is, is trying to figure out, you know, who, who am I separate from, from where I came from? And it's, it's going to be a long time before it's able to be strong enough that it can look at where it came from and it can see its own shadow in that reflection. And it can even contemplate re-immersing re, re itself in a relationship with the self without being devoured by it. So this, I think, is the drama that we've been involved in for a long time, is trying to build an ego that is strong enough that it can relate to the self as an I-thou relationship. And one of the things that helps build the ego is strife and suffering and turmoil and we've had plenty of that right mm -hmm. what we what we needed maybe not what we wanted yeah so so with the ego emerging out of the unconscious and and in a sense it's it's what we what we want to be and and that's splitting um it it is the beginning of differentiation and so it's the personification of consciousness, so light and clarity and uh, free will, will, being able to willfully decide to do something and do it. That's, a, that's an achievement of the ego, um, assertiveness, action, all, all of that. 
and having a sense of, of yourself as a unique other, that's, that's all an achievement. And it's archetypally masculine, I think. So the tendency was, right from Adam and Eve as the creation myth, we see um, Eve gets demonized as, as bad. And, and that's, I think, this original splitting of the ego emerges and we suddenly have this separation of masculine and feminine archetypes. And the, the masculine, which is the task for all of us, gets held up as the, um, the, the positive thing. And even though the ego has this really destructive shadow side, we needed to develop an ego. And so all of the negative side has been accepted as just the way that it has to be. So I think that's why we're more tolerant of that. So, so the more this little ego tries to emerge out of the water uh, and the energy is going into that and the unconscious is falling down, uh, falling away, the, the dark feminine is then portrayed as the embodiment of all that this little ego fears, the dangerous aspect of the unconscious. And it is personified by women and projected onto women. So the image is uh, seductive, evil, conniving, trickery, because this is sort of how the little ego experiences the unconscious as threatening to devour it, the devouring maw, the, you know, the gaping uh, mouth. All the dangerous affects and shadow qualities, um, murder, murderous death, uh, superstition, anything uncanny, that's associated with the unconscious um, is very threatening to this little ego. And I think the culmination of that was the, the witch trials, right? Mm -hmm. It was our final attempt to try and stamp out the unconscious once and for all, just get rid of it, kill it off. And of course we couldn't. So um, the unconscious becomes this devil trying to ensnare the the, uh, the ego in its web. And I think women have carried that projection for a long time. And so the attempt then is, if you can project it onto women, maybe you have some hope of then corralling it and containing it and, and controlling it. Um, and that's, that's exactly what patriarchy has tried to do, uh, is, is control women that way. That she must be controlled, rendered impotent, powerless, her feet bound, body covered head to toe so that she can't see or be seen, and reduced, kept in the home. The second phase, the mythological or imaginal phase, Whitmont calls it. This is a bridge from magical to mental functioning. <clears throat> We're not quite... We're past there, so we're, we're more mental functioning collectively. But this is the transition, mythological. So the transition here that's going on is from the gynolatric to the uh, androlatric. So moving from valuing feminine, um, archetypal feminine, to valuing more archetypal masculine now. There's a movement from nomadic societies that were egalitarian to more of a sedentary lifestyle. The, uh, the fertile uh, valley, uh, people started to settle down and, and farm animals and agriculture, and there started to be a, a surplus of food for the first time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that probably was one of the factors that contributed to patriarchy because then there was a, a starting to fight over the surplus. That, that's one of the theories. So this is a beginning separation of the opposites, but at this stage they weren't uh, exclusive. They were inclusive. So some, something could be A and not A at the same time. So uh, you could be here and not here. You could be dead and alive. You could, um, it could be past and present. The focus was still on here and now and direct experience. So God was this stone. God is this animal. 
that God wasn't something removed or abstract because we weren't really there yet as far as abstract abstracting. As it progressed, the unitary reality starts to fragment more and more into a multiplicity of mutually exclusive opposites, good and evil, subject and object, like, dislike, worthy, unworthy. And, of course, then the ego likes to identify with one end of that and the other one gets repressed. Notions of state, nation, remote ruler, distant god didn't exist yet. They were still at a kind of thinking feeling, so undifferentiated in terms of um, if you liked or desired something, then it, it would be deemed it must be good or right. And, and whatever then is uh, feared must be evil or wrong. So you can see where that got us, that got women especially into... But not just women. I mean, that's also wars play out that way, too. And men have suffered in patriarchy also. Uh, okay, so... Sorry, I'm not keeping up with my slides here. Okay, so... We went through that one. Okay, so there's correspondence in the child... <clears throat> At this stage, the child shifts to the mythological phase around three or four until puberty. So now they're interested in hearing fairy tales and stories and myths. And the ego starts to solidify into a sense of I. And that, that's the terrible twos or threes, right? And they start realizing, hey, I'm separate. That means I can say no. And they start connecting inner experience with the outer world as it's not necessarily exactly the same. But, you know, if I smile, I can make my mom smile or I can make her happy or those kind of things. A sense of shame emerges at this point because now we have an ego that can feel shame. And there's increasing reflectiveness in terms of thinking, uh, emotion, affect, images and fantasy and fairy tales. So Whitmont writes, as people with a feeling and will of their own look up from the ground, from the mere animal-like containment in nature to the opening sense of freedom of the heavens, they call themselves anthropos, Greek for who looks up. So this is the little fish again, right? <laughs> He's looking, looking up. Yet with the development of the self-will, the instinctual immediacy of cosmic will is lost. The result is the fall of man. So that's the price for this, this little ego separating is it loses that connection to the thing that is greater than itself. At least for a while, it's, it's part of this arc that for a while it loses it. And I think, incidentally, we're still on the upward trajectory here. We haven't yet turned the corner um, for the most collectively. Certain, certainly individuals have. Okay. Continued, so... As the reasoning light of the mind grasps the world in its outer concrete manifestation, the inner gnosis, or the knowing of the soul, with its magical instinctual attunement to fundamental survival needs and collective dynamics, is lost to consciousness. Toward the end of the mythological age, the cry is heard that the great Pan is dead. He's replaced by the Father in heaven, whose place eventually is usurped by the now deified reasoning I. So this is, God is dead, and now the ego is God. So then we have the, ri the rise of patriarchy continues. So, um, yeah, it probably arose in relation to uh, agriculture and then competing for the resources, because that's one of the shadow sides of the ego, right, is now if I'm separate then I can get things for myself, and that means I can take them from you, from somebody else. And, and now competition sets in, and um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Capitalism, uh, materialism, and getting stuff for ourselves, things. 
So with the rise of male dominance came new laws that supported men's desire to own women, control their bodies, reproduction, their possessions, dowries, property. In The Ascent of Women, woman, it's, uh, she goes into the whole history of this, and it's pretty, it's astonishing, actually. I mean, I didn't grow up feeling um, unequal to men or feeling like men... Um, abused power against me in this way, but looking at the history, the men would be shocked too. I mean, it's it's pretty grisly, really, the last 6,000 years. So women couldn't own property, couldn't vote, couldn't work outside or even leave the house, you know, often had to be covered from head to toe. They had no sexual or legal rights. They were owned by their fathers and then their husbands and then their own sons. Women were put to death for adultery. Virginity became a requirement for marriage. And and so for women, the laws just kept getting stricter and stricter, and the penalties for breaking them just got more and more brutal. Rape wasn't an offense against the woman, but an economic offense against the man who owned her. With the... um, uh, Enmatina and Uruka Gina Cones. So this was about 2400 BC, so 44,500 years ago, roughly. The earliest law codes on tablets uh, have been found, and this was really the first total silencing of a woman's voice. If a woman speaks out of turn, then her teeth will be smashed by a brick. That was read right, right off of the tablet. And, um, and so from here it was up and down, but mostly down for women's rights for a long time. The Assyrians, about 1200 BC, reduced women's power further. The world became obsessed with male virility, militaristic conquest driven. The lion hunt was a symbol of dominance. 12, 112 new laws came down, over half of them dealing with marriage and sex and, and all about just restricting women further and further and further. <laughs> Protections that had existed for women were removed and the price for nonconformity became uh, more extreme. The patriarchal double standard was enshrined. Um, the wife of a rapist could be raped as a punishment Abuse of women is legitimized. You can kill your wife without cause or consequence. Um, Law number 40 was the first veiling law. This was 2,000 years before Islam. Only a prostitute could not veil herself. Everybody else must. And women were divided into five categories. Wives and daughters of the upper class. So if you had a male to protect you, Um, But beyond that, temple prostitutes, concubines, harlots, and slave girls. These were the choices that women had. It's a miracle anybody ever had children. A prostitute who veils herself is to be arrested and brought to court, ears cut off, 50 lashes with a bamboo cane. The man who arrested her may take her clothes away. That's all written on the tablet. That apparently came down to us from God. Mm-hmm. By 600 BC in Athens, democracy applied only to men. Women were silent and absent from the public record. 1952, women in Greece got the right to vote. Hesiod in 700 BC, women were portrayed as a separate species. Pandora was sent as punishment for mankind. Through her womb flowed all the evils of the world. Aristotle saw women as sub-male, imperfect men because no semen to create the essence of man. Asia was almost exclusively male-dominated. Women had to be chaste, obedient, beholden to husbands. Foot binding, the actual breaking the foot and binding it under itself, was a requirement for marriage and had to be done by the mother by the, uh, starting by the age of five or six. It was banned in 1902. The I Ching, um, 2,000 years ago, was balanced and complementary of yin and yang. They were, they were equally valued, and then in 179, yin was made inferior to yang as part of the Confucianist canon, and they claimed 
that this came down from God, patriarchy as divinely ordained, men giving themselves the benefit of God on their side. The idea was that women were incapable of rational thought. This was used to justify domestic violence against women. Egypt was always a little bit of an exception. Women were all, women always had some rights uh, in Egypt, and um, uh, Hatshepsut ruled for twenty years there. But then, as soon as she died, every, everything was egalitarian when she was ruler. And then, as soon as she died, um, her the next pharaoh erased everything of her from the records. By the first century AD in Rome, Rome was influenced positively by Egypt and emancipated women. 17th century Europe, we have the witch trials. Women were seen as more susceptible to evil spirits because they're weaker. A witch was whatever was the opposite of the political ideal, the patriarchal ideal. The Quran enshrined unequal gender roles, called women a blight on the earth. The Mahabharata called women a poison, serpent, and death all in one. The Pantheon um, has all the, it's got written around it to, to great men, a grateful nation. It's all men. There's not a single woman. Um, from the 18th, including 18th and 19th centuries. So women were essentially written out of history, betrayed and excluded from the societies that they helped to create. And even today, women represent about 20% of the world's political power. So the third phase, the mental phase. In the mental or patriarchal ego phase, control of aggression and desire is a matter of law and ethics. The rational mind becomes the supreme arbiter control of nature, inner and outer, which are now separate, marks the patriarchal mental phase. Basic to the patriarchy and its andrelactric frame of reference are rejection and devaluation of A, the feminine deity and corresponding feminine values, B, natural drives, and C, spontaneous emotions and desires. The first vestiges of a conscious ego are all developed by controlling and repressing subjective urges and needs, that is, by self-denial. So you can see still how this fragile ego is trying to somehow build itself up. But the primitive defenses that it needs at at that point, it needs the wall. At that, at that stage, right? Attributes of the mental phase, the highest value is, is sensate reality. The five senses, the physical world that can be seen. Reality derives from Latin res, a thing, and it means thingness. So if you think about materialism today, that, that makes a lot of sense. Whatever can't be spatially perceived is denied reality. So the soul, God, um, you know, any spiritual, any, any, all that stuff falls into the unconscious. The world is perceived as clusters of inert, lifeless particles pushed around randomly by something called energy. Causation has become limited to what can be de- demonstrated by a sequence directly observable by the senses and mechanically, statistically reproducible in an experimental setup. <laughs> That's exactly where we are, right? That's the only research that is acceptable to the APA. The emotional ordering of experience is replaced by coldly objective weighing of fact and detail as perceived by the senses. Conquest of material reality is the goal. Atom, moon, outer space, science, constructing civilization. The world of mythological images loses value. That's just fantasies. They're they're not real. The world of animals, trees, oceans become dumb and soulless. They're to be used for our purposes. Everything is to serve the ego. But independently of our rational consciousness, unbeknownst to the ego... 
the repressed, split-off psychic organism continues to function in the form of what we now call the magical and mythological dimensions of the unconscious. This includes our unconscious fantasies, imaginings, emotions, drives, awareness of instinct, ESP, dreams, participation, mystique. So these enrich but also thwart our reasoning. So the ego likes to think it's really rational and um, and right, but there's all this other stuff going on in the unconscious that it's not aware of that is also contaminating it and, and influencing and sort of having its way with the ego. This extroverted, rational, materialistic orientation corresponds to most uh, post-puberty right up until the midlife crisis. With the midlife crisis comes a breakdown of this view because it's not sustaining and a venturing into uncharted territory because anything's better than staying with the, me- the dead mental um, viewpoint of reality. The power drive of the ego and the rattling of the repressed contents leads to increasing maladaptation which precipitates a crisis that heralds the next phase which is as yet collectively unknown. So what is this drama that's been playing out? What's really meant by the terms feminine and masculine in the symbolic archetypal sense? Gender, okay, so we'll talk about gender a little bit. So gender is in, is evolving. Gender is complicated and non-binary. Masculine and feminine are no longer clearly defined or exclusive. We're becoming more androgynous. Even sex symbols are less polarized, right? People that we used to really, the manly men and the, you know, the... Uh, very feminine women, they're caricatures now, because now we expect women to have, you know, some more masculine development, and men have to have some feminine development, or nobody would want to be in a relationship with them. (laughs) So they're not attractive to us anymore. So they probably don't find mates, and then they can't reproduce, so hopefully that'll take care of itself. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, unisex names are on the rise. Um, yeah, and the the Facebook, you should check that out. I mean, the the list is unbelievable. I'd have to I had to look up a whole bunch of them to figure out what the differences were, but um, it's definitely evolving. So National Geographic did a whole um, a whole um, special edition on gender, the gender revolution. And Katie Couric did a documentary. You can watch that on YouTube. It's very good. <clears throat> More teenagers are identifying themselves with non-traditional gender labels, such as transgender, gender fluid. Um, the Journal of Pediatrics, just in October, found that 3% of Minnesota teens, I'm from Minnesota, so I, I looked up Minnesota, <laughs> they do not identify as boy or girl cisgender they identify with the they, they do not identify with the gender assigned at birth gender non-conforming 2018 surveys 9 million adults in the US are lesbian gay or bisexual 3.5% of adults of these bisexuals are s- the slight majority women are substantially more likely than men to identify as bisexual Estimates of those who report any lifetime same-sex behavior and attraction are substantially higher than that. There are nearly 700,000 transgender individuals in the USA. 19 million Americans have engaged in same-sex behavior. Uh, 25 million Americans acknowledge some same-sex attraction. Many people do not identify clearly with only one archetypal gender. 
um, which I think supports Jung's theory that we are all we're all a mix of both. I mean, if you think about yourself, you know, what percentage would you say you are masculine and feminine? I always had a sense of a, a masculine aspect that you know that you could, that I could feel that, and it felt good. It felt good, but feminine did too, right? So, so there was a, an awareness of both of them. And I think one of the things that this does is it liberates all of us to not feel so much like we have to identify with one or the other, that we can just find whatever is authentically our blend, our proper blend. Sorry, this is a whole bunch of words here. Um, I wanted to look up how the dictionary defined masculine, and I was kind of surprised by how primitive the description was pertaining to or characteristic of a man or men, having qualities traditionally ascribed to men as strength and boldness of a woman, mannish. That's a direct quote from dictionary.com. Absolute failure to differentiate archetypal from gender. So masculine equals men equals desirable. Men became conflated with the archetypal masculine associated with consciousness rationality, light, achievement, strength, competence, intelligence, doing, courage, linearity, thinking, self-mastery, and then also the shadow side of power, corruption, dog-eat-dog capitalism, materialism. But these were accepted as necessary evils. So all of that, all of that got projected onto men. And... Everything opposite and undesirable, the unconscious as it's perceived by ego consciousness, gets projected onto women and minorities. Darkness, death, failure, weakness, irrelevance, invisibility, incompetence, emotionality, being fearful, instinct driven, feeling, desire, impulsivity, witches, um, and are then deemed valuable only to the degree that they serve. the the ego values of the patriarchy. So women have then fallen into this pattern, I think, over the last 6,000 years of just trying to keep themselves out of hot water by being good, being quiet, um, being helpful, being all of these things so that they didn't get burned at the stake. It's little wonder why they became hysterical, right, in Freud's day. (laughs) how much they had to repress of themselves gender has been a tempting hook for the projection of consciousness and the unconscious because they provide real life images concretizations of archetypal realities Everything that patriarchal ego consciousness has devalued and projected onto women needs to be redeemed by all genders. The earth, child rearing, compassion, subjectivity, heart, relationship. So the the proposal is that masculine is a term that we use, it's a personification to designate ego consciousness. Directed thinking, goal-directed, discriminating, capable, all of these uh, good qualities, these all get projected onto men. And feminine is a personification of those traits that are archetypally associated with the unconscious. I know that's a repetition, but it was important. Consciousness has always been personified as archetypally masculine, and the unconscious as archetypally feminine, even in dreams. So that's important, I think, because, you know, even, even the self, the unconscious, presents archetypal masculine and feminine with certain images. So if we have dreams about um, an ocean or a body of water, you know, we, we usually we associate that with the unconscious and, and a forest with, with uh, the, the feminine, both of those with the feminine, the feminine unconscious. And, and there's no, not a problem with that. 
on the archetypal level. The only problem has been when we took to projecting these onto women and men as as genders, and we genderize them as if men and women are um, don't have access to to both of the the archetypes or all of the archetypes within themselves. But this is what the psyche does with unconscious material. It projects it, and then we can see it, and then possibly we can reclaim it. So it's kind of a just-so thing the way I look at it. I mean, I don't feel like men did something wrong with patriarchy. I, I think that this was an evolutionary dynamic that that is a just so thing. I think it, it is what it needed to be and and that's what it that's here we are. We've paid the price. Now what are we gonna do with it? So no Eric Neumann says in Fear of the Feminine, which is a, a book that I do recommend, the treasure hard to attain is consciousness. In the West, the attainment of consciousness is bound up with the symbolism of the masculine. And the force is antithetical to consciousness, represented especially by the instinctual world of the unconscious, are connected with the symbolism of the feminine. This association inevitably leads to a devaluation of the feminine, which for the masculine and for the sort of consciousness associated with it, represents what is dangerous and negative, the night side of consciousness. Neumann, I think, was probably the one who um, first and most helped me to um, understand this, this stuff. I think he died at an early age, too, which is unfortunate. He was kind of Jung's uh, golden boy, I think. This is Neumann continued. The feminine is linked with the unconscious, not only because it is the birthplace of consciousness and hence the great mother. Above and beyond this, those identified with the masculine also inevitably experience in the feminine the dangerous instinctuality of their own nature. Hence, the feminine and whatever is associated with it appears as the danger par excellence of falling into the unconscious. That's the little fish again. So it has to be demonized and separated and devalued. Uh, let me just see where we're at here. Okay. Maybe in a few minutes we can take a break and then come back. Sound, sound good? Okay, so this is a really important quote. I think the most important one. Neumann again. This is not, however, a question of voluntary association, but rather of one that is archetypal. This means that although such an evaluation of the feminine by the masculine is objectively false, it will not give way until the psychological self-knowledge of the masculine and of those identified with it has been able to see that it is involved in a projection of archetypal symbols. Mm -hmm. That's it, right there in a nutshell, is, you know, we have to separate and differentiate that we are projecting these archetypal dynamics onto men and women, and that's not, that's not who they are. And until we can become psychological enough to recognize that the, arch that the, the reality of the psyche and that the, the archetypal is a, it's a real um, compelling force, and if we're not conscious of it, we're going to project it. If we haven't integrated in ourselves, we're going to project it. So, and women are always going to be the likely um, receptacle for that projection. One way to envision the emerging feminine is to think of the center shifting from egocentered, egocentric, 
to the hypothetical center that is between ego and unconscious. This is what Jung talked about, right? About how the center shifts from the center of the ego to the center of ego, uh, conscious and unconscious together. That that's a that's a different center point, and we have to shift to that cent- that as our center. So now we have access then to conscious and unconscious. And Eric Neumann talked about the ego self axis that we build this bridge so that material can flow both ways from between conscious and unconscious. But we're still in that ego-centered place where the unconscious isn't even really factored in collectively, the mental phase. So this is not just a between point. By uniting this masculine and feminine, the conscious and unconscious, a new higher order entity is born, the divine child. So something emerges out of that. You know, whenever that's the transcendent function, whenever you hold opposites together consciously, something can emerge out of that, and it'll always be of a higher order. So then we have the the little fish makes this full circle reconnection with the self, but where it was unconscious at the beginning, there's now uh, an observing ego consciousness to... Um, connect with the self. So now we have this I-thou relationship that's possible. But that requires a really secure ego. With a secure enough ego, we can open up to the experiences of synchronicity, magic, interconnectedness, non-locality, the non-rational, the numinous, the shadow, the inner voices, signs, the other, but with a conscious eye with which to relate and witness. This is what we have paid for, bought and paid for the past 6,000 plus years. The possibility of a true union of masculine and feminine within each of us and the birth of a new stage of human development that I think is impossible to predict what that could look like at this point. But I think, you know, where Jung talked about individuation as opposed to individualism, where he said, you know, it's not about sitting on a mountain all all by yourself. It's about (coughs) pursuing and developing what is within you, but then bringing it back into the collective. So it's this... Uh, sort of ego self access played out in, in the collective then of all of these individuals who are individuals but are also participating to create this collective. That's, I think, probably the my best guess of what the future looks like if we can do this. Should we take a break now? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Welcome back. Okay, so I don't have I don't have tons more. We're going to go through the remainder of what I have, and then I'd really like to have some open discussion so we can see what's getting activated and and um, try and move this forward a little more together. Okay, so the divine child. Maybe everybody's read this. Um, Mythological images that we have of this this new third, I think, uh, Jesus, angels, uh, gods who are part human and part divine, like Mercurius, the most revered of all the gods in many cultures, both masculine and feminine, um, sometimes portrayed as one, sometimes others. Um, he can travel between the two realms, messenger god. This is what the return of the feminine principle united with the masculine principle brings to us. So um, some of the figures like Moses and Buddha and Horus and Krishna, they're all images of this um, sort of unity of masculine and feminine, almost to the point where it's difficult to distinguish which they are. You know, the... the, um, I don't know where I heard this once, but that the Mona Lisa is an image of Jesus potentially. As but the thing with the Mona Lisa is, you look at it and you, th- if you're thinking it's a female, it looks like a female, and if it, you think it's a male, it looks like a male, right? It's it's perfectly androgynous. 
Um, and I don't know if androgyny is what, what we're moving toward necessarily, but maybe that's something we can, we can discuss further. But we do have images. We have these towering figures that have appeared at various points in history that seem to be what we're aspiring to become. They're, they're like an, an image of what an integrated uh, brain looks like, for one thing. Peaceful, calm, um, thinking, feeling, but in a differentiated way. Um, intuitive, but also sens sensually connected. Um, wholeness, one would call it. So we need the ego, problematic as it is. This is from Letters, Volume 2, Jung's Letter to Pastor Tanner. Nobody seems to have noticed that without a reflecting psyche, the world might as well not exist, and that, in consequence, consciousness is a second world creator, and also that the cosmogonic myths do not describe the absolute beginning of the world, but rather the dawning of consciousness as the second creation. There's a, there's a book by Marie von Franz of creation myths that's really interesting in, to, to look at in, with this in mind. Um, because it, it's all there in the myths, right? The Adam and Eve myth is the most popularized one, but it's, it's the, the dawn of the ego has been forecasted and known for a long, long time. And it's really sort of the center of our culture. It's, um, it's at the heart of everything, really. Without the conscious ego, there can be no I-thou relationship. This requires two others, and they need to be separate. So in alchemy, we start out with uh, Massa Confusa. Everything is just kind of um, tangled together. Nothing's been differentiated. And then it has to go through this process of separatio, where you separate out the, the different, whether it's through evaporating, boil, you know, boiling. There's always heat involved. And certainly we've, been, we've had lots of heat for the last forever. <laughs> um, but that's what allows the, the separation to happen. And then once the the different materials are fully separated, they can be brought together again, but it's a whole new thing from what it was when it was just the Massa Confusa. So. It seems to me, it seems to be reasonable to assume that if nature has worked this hard to create the ego, there must be a good reason for it, and I can't accept that our current state of affairs satisfies this goal. Okay, so this is Neumann's, this is that key um, paragraph that he wrote that I just want to read again and, and go into further. This means that although such an evaluation of the feminine by the masculine is objectively false, it will not give way until the psychological self-knowledge of the masculine and of those identified with it has been able to see that it is involved in a projection of archetypal symbols. So this means that we must, we must all become psychological. And Neumann talked about the, the new dispensation, I think he called it. It's, it's like the next stage of our evolution, and it's to become psychological. He called it the psychological dispensation. Without depth psychology, without a separation of the archetypes from gender, without work to integrate our own shadow and its projection onto others, Without this ideal of wholeness, this kind of acting out that we've been engaged in is just going to continue. And, you know, for, for women, it, it's interesting. I read somewhere a long time ago, and I haven't been able to find the reference, but in, in sociology, it's known that whenever there's a new, a new culture developing, the old one always is always suppressed and repressed and devalued. And, um, and when, when the masculine is in this position of, of sort of ascendance and the feminine has been so devalued, 
you can see where for women it would be it would be easy and tempting to want to integrate the masculine. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, maybe it's easier for women to achieve wholeness. I don't know about that. But for men, I think the difficult part would be what's going to convince them to want to integrate this part that's been so devalued until they hit midlife and maybe they're just in dire straits because their life has just become so dry and dull and lacking anything juicy and feminine and that's when they have to reclaim it to save their own soul basically right um but i think that's that's the hard part for them the return of the feminine See where my notes are. Try and keep myself integrated here. It's a work, right? Okay. Right. I scribbled that over here. So, on the personal level, First of all, let, let me start with this. I, I think there are sort of three, three things involved in um, what's required of us. Well, we'll get to that next time. Let's go through this first. On the personal level, women are refusing to accept the projections and limitations that have been placed on them. So that's, you know, the Larry Nassar stuff, Me Too, all of that. That's We're seeing women kind of uprising and trying to throw off these projections and say, that's not, that's not who I am. That's not acceptable. I, I don't want to be um, treated that way, restricted in that way. And if you watch The Ascent of Woman, you'll see that women have done this over and over and over again in the last 6,000 years. And every time they got squashed down even further after it. And... Um, but they keep trying, you know, and even birth control, because women figured out until they can get control over their own bodies, um, they're, they're really going to stay in this position of um, vulnerability. And it was, it was women, uh, personally, that came up with the, the pill. And women who put up the money it was the McCormicks that put up the money to, to come up with the, the first prototype of the pill. So, and even today there's a movement to take away women's rights to their own body and to reproduction. And, um, you know, if we lose that, then, then we're, we're heading downward again. So they're speaking up about sexual abuse, pursuing careers, refusing sole responsibility for child rearing, um, fighting for their bodies and reproduction. Sexual ideals are changing. Um, men are expected to have some kind of feminine development, to participate at home, to, uh, to do that. And in my experience, for the most part, I think feel enriched by that. On the archetypal level, nature herself seems to be fighting back against the arrogance and ignorance of the ego's egocentricity, our abuse of the earth, pollution, ceaseless expansion, doing things just because we can, regardless of whether we should. <laughs> but, you know, that's just that's the nature of the ego. So as long as it's operating... Um, rogue it's going to do things like that okay yeah speak to uh, like the age of Aquarius is that do you see that as kind of part of the third way I am not familiar enough with um, okay. astrology to connect that do you want to say more well it's just kind of like you said the, right now we're in the process of kind of shaking off the matriarchy and this is seen as the last the patriarchy. of the old and moving into the not that, that there won't be room for men but the feminine kind of will, will blossom or the feminine in men and women and that's seen as part of the age of the Okay. 
There's a really great essay on just that in the Red Book for Our Time. Huh. The first volume of essays about the Red Book. That, um, do you know what I'm talking about? The, after the Red Book came out, there, there was a volume called uh, the Red Book for Our Time, and now there's a second one coming out. But in the first one, there is an essay that speaks just to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So what is required of us for this new third to emerge? Conscious discrimination of the difference between gender as a symbol of conscious and unconscious and individual people who embody both archetypes. So I'm thinking, you know, the psyche symbolizes. We have dreams. You dream about your uncle and he's acting like an ape, let's say. Um, I don't know where that one came from, sorry. (laughs) Um, You know, that doesn't mean that we think now that our uncle is an ape, because, you know, it's just the psyche uses everything as symbols. Offense, you know, it's, it's symbolizing something, but the symbol is different from the actual thing. And, and this is true, I think, also for men and women. I mean, conscious and unconscious are kind of the two big constructs. And male and female are kind of the two big constructs, right, in the material world. And so, as above, so below. There's, Eric Neumann has an... Uh, uh, he wrote about the, uh, the law of correspondences and how they're, you know, between all of the different levels, like the, the spiritual and the material there are correspondences between all all the levels. And so um, it's just, that's what I, that's when I, when I said, you know, we can't do away with, with the terms masculine and feminine. They're, they're too big for that. They're, they're, um, they're just these overarching archetypal forces and we have to grapple with them. So, I think the the key, the solution, is in how to um, understand them in the right context and bring them into consciousness so that we're no longer projecting them. So there's another slide. I suppose I left it out, but there's a you know Jung talks about the anima as an image of the unconscious and a bridge to the unconscious, and. I don't think I understood it on the level that I do now until I started preparing this talk, but everything that we project onto gender, um, whether it's a man project, whatever he projects onto women, those are split off parts of himself. And if he can use those projections, not to identify with her, but... um, they, those projections are the key to his own wholeness. He can he can see them now. That's where he's projecting them. So, so men have to ask themselves, what do I project onto women? And and we have to ask. Women have to ask, what do I project onto men? And and then that's where our work is is in reclaiming that. But the projections are kind of the key to the kingdom. Even though they've been the problem, they're, they're also the key. So the second one is we have to withdraw, withdraw these projections and own them. And then we have to hold the tension of opposites by consciously valuing consciousness and the unconscious. Value the ego, but also value the, um, the ground out of which it emerged. You know, the the great mother, we have to be able to reconnect with that. And on the material plane, with the collective, that, you know, like Jung said, if you're going to individuate, you you have to bring something back into the collective. Otherwise, it's unethical, it's, it's immoral to just separate yourself and go your own way. You have to bring something back in. And I think that's why he wrote so many books and why he did so much to bring it to bring it back. And thank goodness he did. For the transcendent function to operate, we have to hold both poles. And when we can do that, we're no longer neurotic. 
masculine and feminine together consciously so that the dynamic tension of opposites can constellate the new emergent third. I think I'm just repeating myself. That's the next part. Jung said that the face we turn toward the unconscious is the face that it will turn toward us. So what's been repressed and devalued, we, we turn a face of devaluation toward that, and that's what, that's what we get back. And he also said, you know, contents, just by virtue of them being repressed into the unconscious, tend to become destructive. Even if they're not intrinsically destructive, they will tend to become destructive just because they've been repressed. Can you say that again? Sorry. Contents that are repressed tend to become destructive just by virtue of being repressed. Because the, the symptoms, the rattling and the, the, the destructiveness is serves the purpose of getting the ego's attention and then potentially recognizing it and bringing it into consciousness. So it's like everything wants to try to become conscious, and if you leave it repressed for too long, it starts rattling the cage. And I think that's what's going on collectively, is we have repressed the feminine, and the cage is rattling loudly right now. You know, we have to start valuing the feminine, or the earth won't be able to sustain us. And... Um, you know, people are killing each other, blowing up children. I mean, we're insane, really, right? We've lost our minds. We've lost our souls. And I think things get worse just before something shifts. We go into a state of crisis, and we're destabilized when we're in crisis, and that's a potential for, for change in that moment. But things have to get pretty bad before we're willing to change because change involves going into the unknown. And even if it's a potential better unknown, it's still an unknown. And the ego does not like unknowns. It likes what's familiar and, and controllable and known, even if it's bad. You know, they did a study of people with illnesses and said, if you could, if you could have a much less serious illness, would you trade? And people said no. <laughs> They'd rather have their bad illness because, you know, it's, they've learned how to deal with it. It's, it's kind of their thing now. So, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, there's this story about, the story that Jung, Jung, Jung used to tell, and I haven't been able to find it. I think it's in one of those books that was written after he died where different analysts told stories about him. Um, but the story, maybe Boris knows. Boris knows everything. I think it was, it's the story about how, so the, um, the caretaker has been living alone in the house for so long while the master has been away that the caretaker has started to think it's his house. And then one day the master comes and knocks on the door. And the caretaker realizes its proper relationship within, within the house. And I think that's, you know, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> the ego hasn't quite realized its proper relationship to why we're here. Why did nature try to create these, these egos? Why did, why did the self, God, whatever we want to call it, want to have something that could be, um, you know, a, a witness to all of this? I think that's just a profoundly moving and important question. Yeah? I don't know that particular story. But I do know the parallel, which I think is in the, in the uh, commentary on the secret of golden flower, okay. where Jung says it's as though the ego has been deposed, but not replaced. Yes, yes, yeah. And elsewhere, he talks about <clears throat> the relativization of the ego. That's a really important um, term. Is 
you know, it's not that we need to get rid of these egos or that they're bad, but they need to be relativized to the self and put in their proper functioning place. Right now, they're, they're rogue, and they're, they're, the ego is now operating in the service of itself. And, and that is, on the one hand, um, I, you know, the, the ego has kind of reveled in that, and yet it's now getting to be more mature. And if you think about child development, you know, the child that needs to separate from his mother... Hopefully at some point that child becomes mature enough that he can then look at his mother, not as his mother, but as another human being that gave him life and um, sacrificed and can enter into a new kind of I-thou relationship with, with her and, and father also and and care for her as she declines um, no, I think this is this is a similar. That's that's the the dynamic. So, it's like the the ego needs to take on a a guardianship role. I think for the earth. I mean, for the animals, for nature, for it. It needs to value and um, and protect and. That, that's one of the questions I always wondered was, you know, it, they explain patriarchy as men grew to power because they were stronger. And I always thought, if they were stronger, wouldn't they be the guardians and the protectors of those weaker? But that's not what the ego does. And it wasn't about men. It was about the ego. It's kind of... Um this, this image of the dragon, you know, the fearsome dragon. Yeah. And that is can be our shadow. It can be... I, I like to see, like, the dragon as a young one, like the inner child, and just want some attention, you know, want some tenderness. Huh. And, um, and kind of how the dragon can be tamed into a puppy dog. You know, and it can be can be a, a good best friend. You know, there's a lot of movies like that where the uh, the dragon gets tamed, and um, but the dragon historically has represented the the mother, the the dangerous, devouring aspect of the mother. But again, if we go back to that idea that it's worse the more it's repressed. As we build a conscious relationship with the dragon, maybe it does become less devouring and more, um, you know, more positive. Yeah, Boris? I would like to suggest a distinction here in the use of the term ego. Uh, I think it might be useful to talk about the immature ego. Mm -hmm. And how that appearism behaves versus a mature ego. And we could play with our terms, but the distinction I think might be useful. Yeah. So much of what you're saying sounds like, uh, on the one hand, here's how the immature ego behaves and acts. Yeah. And on the other, what we need is a mature ego that doesn't act that way. Right. Other Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, so when you went back to the little fish, right? Yeah. There, the ego defenses can kind of be ranked from more primitive to um, less primitive. Mm -hmm. And I think as the ego actually builds in strength, it needs fewer, fewer and fewer of those types of defenses. And so then it becomes more able, as the defenses fall away, it becomes more open and able to connect with other people, with the self, uh, with, with anything, inner, inner and outer. But with the defenses, back to Trump's wall, it's, um, that's a very primitive ego defense. And those are the ones like denial, repression. You know, repression is different from suppression. Repression is unconsciously, stuff is just, is just unconsciously falls off into the unconscious. But suppression is where there's a conscious pushing it into the unconscious. 
So at least there's some aspect of consciousness with that. But repression is it's really primitive. It's just it's completely gone. So to follow this out just a bit, what would be the content, descriptively, of immature egos? And I'm suggesting that the immature is attached to certain content. But I don't know what kind of content a mature ego would be attached to. Well, I mean, an immature ego would be like the, uh, the schoolyard bully, mm-hmm. right? A mature ego is somebody who can, maybe someone hurts them, but they're able to step back and um, think about it, think about the other person, think about where it might be coming from before they just react. So there's a thinking, feeling response. It, it's a, it comes from a more integrated place. It's not reactionary. Um, it's not demeaning of the other person. It's not retaliatory. It's they're going to go about go about um, thinking thinking about it and processing it and maybe trying to engage the person in in a, in a higher level kind of uh, process. So that reminds me of something else that Jung says in Secret of Golden Power commentary that uh, yeah, it's as though there. He doesn't use the term mature ego, I don't think. He talks about individuation, but uh, consciousness is as though on the mountaintop, and it's well aware of the noise and the conflict in the valley, but it's not affected by it. So there's a perception, and maybe an experience, but it's not engaged or pulled into it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, this use of uh, the individuation term made me think of this. A relativized immature ego or immature ego is kind of the essence of individuation, isn't it? So as you individuate properly, you're getting to that point where you are able to encompass these differing points of view and differing... Building a stronger yeah, ego. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's an absolutely necessary process of indivi- part of individuation is um, to develop that, that stronger ego. And, you know, when people come into analysis, if they don't have a strong enough ego to work with unconscious contents, you don't work with unconscious contents right in the beginning. You work with building their ego to be strong enough so that they can lower some of the defenses and then they can begin to um, engage with their own unconscious contents without feeling overly threatened or overwhelmed by it because you don't want to fragment the ego even more. But in a sense, when you have that mature ego, yeah. it is in a place where it's willing to give up some of that control yes. because it has less fear. And it, That's right. So as it's giving up the control, it's more able to get in touch with self. Absolutely. So that on the ego self-axis, it's allowing itself to get a little bit closer towards self. Completely, yeah. And that's the relativization of the ego to the self, yeah. Yeah. I've come across the phrase conscious vulnerability. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So that to me describes a, a mature ego. That's a ego good that's able to be stung and hurt and mm-hmm. consciously work it through. Right. Your description. Of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and another example would be you know we run into perfectionism all the time. An ego that's that's fragile or brittle or or defended. It needs to be more perfect because it can't tolerate criticism, it can't tolerate um, the vulnerability that you're talking about. Yeah. As a parent, I'm wondering how you might translate some of this information uh, in raising three daughters. Uh-huh. Um, the third, <laughs> this is symbolically. Uh, um, and, and just in the, in the midst, or in this energy field of, of all this kind of chaotic patriarchal mm-hmm. grasping. Yeah. Well, you have some wisdom too. Well, I have a son and a daughter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, 20 and 22. Son is 22. And I hear about this stuff all the time with him with the me too, you know, that a, a sense of shame at being a male right now, which is terrible. Um 
and my daughter feeling vulnerable with you know confused about all of this stuff and so I just talk with them about it all the time I mean Mm -hmm. they're you know they're they're pretty educated Mm -hmm. at this point Mm -hmm. and they find it liberating they talk to their friends about it Um, but I think for my son in particular it's felt um, Un, like it's, it's he, he no longer feels demonized in the same way because he has more of an understanding of, of where it's coming from and what, what the bigger picture is. I mean, we've covered a lot of theory here today, but I have always felt that if we don't have these kind of theories to hold experience, we can't make sense of them. If we have the wrong theory and then we have an experience and that's the vessel that we put it in, it doesn't work. We need bigger and we need better theories that can hold all of these experiences in a, in a way that's constructive and productive. So it's very practical. Yeah. You, know, uh, you said something earlier uh, that is so standard about hearing psychological theory about the children leaving, separating from mother, going out into the world with mother mediates that. Yeah. So it's something that kind of corrected that um, later on. It just it, 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 it currently in talk. And I think that <clears throat> that that we need to question that whole separation, individuation from mother. I think that there is a way in which that that separation from naming it that way, that we separate from mother, maybe contributes to the way we demonize women. You know, we're supposed to separate boys, especially, right? Because girls end up maybe identifying more with mother, given the gender issue. But it's it's it, it's here. It, to me now, it's problematic to even hear those standard theories that we learned in school. You know, kids grow up and they need to separate from mother. And I just I heard it when you said it earlier in a. Like, do we? Do we need to separate from mother? Well, I think we do in the sense that we need to figure out who we are. And, like, I've been a pretty power... I'm, 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 I've got a lot of mother archetype in me. Mm-hmm. And I've been a really powerful influence, I think, in my kids' lives. And I know that they have needed to separate from that. But it's been a really gradual and gentle process because I've, I've allowed them, I've encouraged them to be themselves and said, you know, what do you think about that? And what do you want? And what appeals to you? And so they felt like they had permission to do that. Yeah, and I think, too, just one more thing about this, that the feminist critics talk about female subjectivity, and so that maybe is what you can be communicated to in your person of not just identifying as a mother, you know, in that role, that you were a subject in your own life and in your own relationship. Yes. And that made the difference. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think when you see rigidities, and we see this all the time in practice, right, where parents have tried to get their kids to conform into a certain pattern and that's where you get the real reactivity because they do need to separate from that to figure out who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with um, the... Uh, my, my concern about the, 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 the theories and um, body of, the huge body of of available thought on on um, the integration and union um, is is that I am searching for a better understanding, and I don't know if I've missed this body of literature or I haven't looked deep because in my field I'm in a field um, that has been defined and dominated historically by men, and I've looked very deeply for a deeper understanding of the feminine and a body, an epistemology of femininity Mm -hmm. and the feminine in order to try to um, define what the the, for the women that I teach um, and to be proud of those qualities of the feminine and what constitutes the mm-hmm. feminine, feminine wisdom, mm-hmm. as an example. Um, bef- you know, I think these, it's 
all of these definitions seem to uh, come from a basis of understanding the masculine and in, in order to integrate the masculine and, and, and the feminine, which I see as a very viable and important mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. And yet we have this enormous body of understanding from men and historical information about the masculine, but not an equal body of information about what constitutes the feminine. Right. And so I guess I ask before we integrate, do we really have enough information for the separate understanding? Do we need to have an understanding of the feminine before there is an interrelatedness and connectivity and integration? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a good question, and that's something that I have struggled. I struggled with in in writing this because I know that I didn't go into that. Yeah, you defined but, the masculine you <clears throat> the definition dictionary, and and a, a lot of the right. writing of Jung and and, no, and and Neumann and Whitmont is, you know, all of that is important. I see that's the way to go, but there's this huge piece that we don't know, mm -hmm. and I've had to go to the the wisdom goddesses of South India and so these esoteric. Um, places to try to find any little bits of what constitutes the f feminine, mm -hmm. um, anthropological bits. Mm -hmm. There's so little contemporary research on what constitutes mm -hmm. the feminine. Yeah, and maybe maybe that needs to be a second phase. I don't know because you know with with the ego sort of being masculine. It's it's emerged first. Maybe the second task then is to use to use that consciousness to be able to to name the feminine, because the feminine, I think, as the unconscious, is harder to get at. It's unconscious. That's why we can't name it. Is it all unconscious? Is that is it unconscious because? Of historic historic perspective, mm -hmm. do you think that historic perspective? What, what I what I know is that what is de deemed traits of masculinity and traits of femininity mm -hmm. have differed in different cultures. The moon was defined as masculine at one point. There is a cultural influence, and I have not been able to come up with a single trait that I would say is masculine or feminine. Exactly. I'm only saying that these are projections of some unknowable archetype of masculinity and feminine, and masculine and feminine, that that aren't s describing specifically masculine or feminine traits, but they're des they're describing opposites that that. That tend to con that that tend to magnetize toward either a center of toward ego consciousness or or toward the unconscious, and we call that masculine and feminine. Do you know what I mean? It's difficult even to use language, and um, but the way complexes act like magnets and and constellate. Um, but I need I need to think about that more. I mean, I, I do hear what you're saying, but yeah, I but I do it, think I there's a, there's like, there's so um, there's it's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. it is. But I think still there's a danger of saying it's about men and women somehow in that, and Absolutely. and I'm trying to get away from that yeah. because yeah. the archetypal masculine and feminine are not about men and women. And, and the feminine isn't necessarily the mother figure either. No, and that's why I don't like the goddess it's, term. Just yeah, like I don't like... Exactly. I mean, the idea that God is male or female is ridiculous. I've always thought. I mean, really? <laughs> like this man in the sky or this woman? You know, it's just... It's so much bigger than that. It's That's a difficult question, though. Sorry. Yeah, Mary. I just want to mention one thing in favor of the term goddess because oftentimes the figures like even in somebody like uh, Jean Boland's book, the uh, God's goddesses of every yeah. woman or the gods of every man it, it 
they really are characteristic so that we can begin. And she, when she writes about the goddesses, she talks about the positive and the negative. Mm -hmm. So they are not to be uh, uh, disavowed just because you can't imagine. They're, they're mythological structures that talk about human traits, and I find them very useful, both clinically and in my own life. I, I do too, but I always tell men and women to read both books mm -hmm. and to find great. them all in yourself. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah that's, that's great. But the idea that we would want to get rid of those the term goddess because actually uh, in mythological stuff with around goddesses, you'll find all the rejected things from patriarchy. That's, that's true. The, yes. They're the containers for all that's yep. missing. Yep. So you're sitting here talking about yep. what can I read or look at that talks about what isn't in patriarchy. Look at goddess tradition. And uh, yeah. you'll get what's not included. Now, I understand your concern right. that it gets uh, idealized in, in this kind of separate uh, way that isn't totally useful because people can get lost in the goddess traditions and not bring it home to bear on their you know everyday life. But that it is a starting place, I think, because it does hold the disowned human qualities mm -hmm. that uh, it gives it begins to give us a handle on how to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's good, and I think too, you know, now that we've gone through this whole process of, of ego development that we have too, it's not about going back to those. M no. those goddess cultures because we, exactly. we can never go back and and even if we try to bring forward from those cultures it's going to be different now just Absolutely. just yeah yeah I don't know who's next sorry I <laughs> uh, just want to make a quick comment about the contemporary scene I just saw uh, on the basis of sex the early story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm. uh, this last week and it was interesting to to watch that movie in this context. Hmm. Yes. So if you think about it in this context now. Uh, because, you know, there's, um, there's, I guess, I think when it comes right down to it, the thing that I think we need to look at, at least on one side with men, is to think about what it means, what power means. Uh, power is, if you think of a strong ego, it's definitely not power over if you're thinking about how right. we're behaving in the world. And to try to figure out how we can teach boys and men what power really should look like mm -hmm. strikes me as being kind of a practical level mm -hmm. of what we need to do. And that's what Ruth Bader Ginsburg was doing mm -hmm. in a sense when she was talking about the, the weight of a lot of laws mm -hmm. that were effectively power over women right. in our whole base of law. Yeah. That she fought, you know, luckily. Yeah. I mean, eventually, and the other, you know, as we look currently at all the women that have just joined the House of Representatives in the United States, yeah. I mean, that's the other side of it where women are starting to say, I'm taking this leadership mm -hmm. and running with it. Right. But it has to come from both sides. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's complex. <laughs> it is complex, yeah. But I see a lot of women taking the leadership positions in our various fields based on the patriarchal model, yeah. reenacting the same kind of the same kind of behaviors and yeah. and power things that have been practiced by their mentors, who happen to be male, yeah. and their mentors' mentors. And therefore, yeah. again, you know, the need for a body of literature on, on how I identify power, how I identify all the, the transformative elements of life through my feminine lens is, 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 is missing from the literature. Yeah, it seems to I think me that's the next stuff. step after <laughs> this. Okay. That's good, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's um, some thoughts I'm just throwing out here. About some thoughts. There's some. There's something about the word, and I mean, it's not words, but discrimination, withdraw, and hold. 
that has a masculine con constellation for me. Mm -hmm. And there's something when I was thinking of looking at it with it is relativizing approach and release. But there seems to be there's something with logos going on here in the presentation uh -huh. that's destination driven yep. and mm -hmm. perhaps process if we're talking about the return of the feminine being okay with process right. and sort of eternal change and being engaged with process versus rushing to a destination because I have found sort of in my own individuation <coughs> process this kind of violence that is created within me when they try to um, get to a destination mm -hmm. and so I'd be aware as a I'm also a professor too mm -hmm. to constellate these things in this very form mm -hmm. of the lecture and of the PowerPoint. Like it's another imagistic, it's another imagistic <laughs> representation of the patriarchy right. within our teaching practices. Right. That's something I'm trying to get my grip on yep. is like in the space of the classroom even, yep. how if, have we internalized yep. a patriarchal way of educating Giving you free it's so absolutely like, hard. To, but but, but yep. these are like some thoughts I was having yeah, yeah. to the side of this whole lecture. Yeah. And then to your point, found I mean, I found the work of Emily Dickinson or of Audrey Lord mm -hmm. to be really useful right now for me. And, uh, Emily Dickinson, in terms of trying to find a way to imagistically represent that which is authentically feminine right. in a complete realm of Western um, European. Yeah. Western European, but, but within her sense of reval revaluing of nature, right. uh, uh, and inscribing within, um, and perhaps it's like the continuation even in the worst of times, mm -hmm. how do we hold the seed of something yeah. so that we don't see this history as being the patriarchy erasing the patriarchy, how do we find within that which has been um, perhaps power over the seeds within something so that we don't I feel there, there's the, the danger too of like depression or the danger too of reactionary movements mm -hmm. this, this, as much as I would love to believe in an evolutionary process of the dawning of a new Aquarian age I also mm -hmm. internally see signs and symbols symbolically worldwide of reactionary repression and a reaction against oh, yeah. um, a, a real, real, real wonderful um, change that Absolutely. has occurred over the 20th century. So these are all little thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, if I didn't have a positive father complex, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, right? <laughs> About this yeah. stuff, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, and these are all these are all just like thoughts to the side <laughs> yeah. of what you presented. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Who's next? Go ahead. Uh, oh, I just <laughs> comment here. So we'll go. You, you, you. Yeah. No, go, go, you, um, you, you. I think okay. people brought up the issue of power because um, I just ran across this definition of patriarchy, which is much more being talked about and used in media. Uh, patriarchy actually means rule of the priest and it means hierarchy. So it's, mm -hmm. there is a term then that is not gender related. Right? I mean, it, it seems like it might be, but the root of, the, of saying it's patriarchy, but it actually means hierarchy. So it is about power and not necessarily about gender. Mm -hmm. It's just been used by men. Um, and then I would question, too, the whole, um, I know this is Neumann, but uh, the, the, is the unconscious feminine? <laughs> yeah. um, and is the ego masculine? I mean, that is the... Uh, that is the word on the street. I think if you look at that's that's I think mythology has portrayed it that way for a long time. I think our dreams even portray it that way. So I don't know. I mean, are they influenced by by consciousness to that degree? I don't know. I don't know if there's an essential archetypal masculine or feminine that feminine. I don't know. Well, it's connected with actual conscious and unconscious. Right. First of all, I think, I'm, I'm not um, a union or familiar with the terminology, but I find it so enriching to hear things talked about in ways that honor so many aspects of ourselves. Yeah. Part of what I was thinking about is how in our world today, 
I think that we don't really know how to deal with otherness. Uh -huh. Otherness in terms of parts of ourselves that are less than conscious, but also otherness in terms of all the fundamentalist and nationalistic movements that are so disturbing in, in the outer world. Yeah. So I just, I, I just wanted to say that. I also want to say that when I think of masculine, in my clinical practice, a lot of what I see is distorted masculine, distorted feminine. The distorted masculine is the bully or the one that wants to overpower. And right. it's not the masculine or the essence of the masculine. Right. When I see women who have the masochistically inclined or you know perennially suffering, or, you know, well, that's distorted feminine. Yeah. So I don't know what it will take for us to go back to the what I think is like the essence of the balanced masculine and feminine, but I think that's part of what you're trying to talk about and the emergence of this this phase that we're longing for. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I have um, children in their 20s, and my 23-year-old is pretty overwhelmed and confused and refusing to be defined or imprisoned mm -hmm. by definitions that don't work. Mm -hmm. But if we are struggling so hard to understand and integrate all this, can you imagine what it'd be like to be a 23-year-old in this world? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it is... It is it is so, so you know what you don't want to be imprisoned by, mm -hmm. but you don't really know who you are or what you're going towards. Mm -hmm. and it's a really, they really don't. Hard time to be it is. The world is so unstable, and yeah. kids, 20 year olds, they don't know. So hard. I think it, their future feels really uncertain and unstable. They don't know what their role is, what their place is. They don't have the same sort of power drives that I think the boomers had. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not interested in the same way. They're they're searching for something else, but they don't know what it is. Yeah, that's my experience of them anyway. My own kids. Yeah. Did you have? Well, I did, but now now I've got her thoughts and her thoughts. And <laughs> to piggyback off of something you were saying about you know, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, like we've been through all these movements from the matriarchal, but there's a difference between matriarchal and matriistic in those terms. Yeah. But, the, but just for sake of simplicity, the movement from the matriarchal into the patriarchal and, and what is next, and, and your statement that the patriarchal was a dynamic that had to be to, to get us to the next place, to the third. But going back to what you were saying in the, the Red Book for our times, it's essays about the oldest Red Book and the, and the essay on astrology. It is talking about you know, the precision of the equinoxes through the constellations. And the dawning of the age of the Aquarius is the, one of the few constellations that has a human um, shape to it. Uh -huh. and, and Jung's writings about it were that all the other stages, we had something to project onto to worship, whether it was female or male, of, of uh, to hold all of this stuff for us. And in the age of Aquarius, it's dependent on each and every individual to to do the work in himself, to draw back those projections and 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 do it. And this is what scares me to death: is that because of the, the patriarchal attitudes that are still rife in the world that are leading to fundamentalism and mass migrations of people and war. Um, I feel like, is there, are there enough people that realize the necessity, even understand the necessity of this work to get us to a tipping point where we can break into the new third? That's the question. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It's pretty perilous. I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, if we, if more of us could do it, then the, there would be support in that individual process because we would be doing it alongside other people doing it, and there would be support for doing it. And you wouldn't be made to feel crazy for right. doing it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Was it Judith or Mary? Um, Judith. I, I, I just wanted to comment. I, um, I, I, um, I feel rather hopeful. I mean, I, I've read articles, especially around the Kavanaugh uh, hearings, that it's kind of the last gasp um, <laughs> of, of role in this hierarchy. And that out of that, 
instability or destabilizing state a lot. If we can hang in there, like your um, uh, tension of the opposite, something will emerge. Right. That, so it's very uncomfortable. We have we love certainty, and but um, I mean we'd rather be in cert with certainty. But if we can if we can go into this, um, it's a delusional place too. <laughs> certainty. So if we can stay with the instability. Um, yeah. Then something new will emerge. Yeah. Yeah. So I have this experience of like we've been such a culture forever of opposition and moving back into integration yeah. or trying to. And I, you know, while I was sitting here today, I was thinking about, you know, when I have someone who's trans that comes in. Like, I sort of automatically drop a lot of things because it's not going to make sense in the way that part of my brain knows it. <laughs> and so it's, like, very much I get to just sit with exactly what is and, like, some part of me gets to like, take a break in a way and, like, just stop thinking and just be with where they're at because it's it's sort of an integrated experience in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And then there, the people who are trans, I see, are also younger, so... 20s, early 30s, um, a lot of people who identify as queer, and they were coming to me with all of these labels, and I was getting irritated. I was like, what are these labels? And like, I was like, why are you labeling yourself? And then I realized they don't feel labels the same way that we felt labels, where we felt them as a very bad thing and as a way to <coughs> segregate. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you're using them for integration. Oh, <laughs> you're right. And I, and I was like, oh, God, that's better. <laughs> so I was getting irritated. I was like, because I felt like it was like a victimization, but it wasn't. Like, they were not feeling victimized. Like, they were feeling right. empowered. Right. And, and then, like, there's all this, like, Snowflake, like the term snowflake that gets used a lot and like it lands on them quite a bit. And I was like, you know what? You take that word back and own it the way like we have like re-owned the word queer. I was like, you take it back because you know what? When it snows, like things get quieter. And if we can like, and there's a sense of integration. And if that's what it's going to do, if your sensitivity and your labels are going to reintegrate things that way and quiet all this BS down, like great. It's going to take a few generations. Mm -hmm. But great Mm -hmm. and because I was like I'm not on board with where they're at I gotta get where they're at otherwise I'm not going to be helpful like Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to help them do what it is they need to do but it is like I do feel that integration so much more with them at least the people that come in to see me you know I I don't know what everybody else is doing but it was kind of a profound day when I like reached the max of my irritation with that labeling mm-hmm. and turned it over and realized like what was happening. I remember like talking to a bunch of colleagues. They were like, "Yeah, no, we're irritated too." I'm like, yeah. Okay, well, here's what I think is happening. Oh yeah. But naming naming is another word for labeling, and it, it, naming is really powerful. You know, it allows yeah. us to see things and um, uh, make them real. It's very much a sense of this is what I am and who I am, and it is not like that or that or that, and this is okay. Right. And it is not yeah. the way, like, culturally many of us grew up. Right, right. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite shows is Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Because <laughs> yes. It is so great, and my daughter loves that show, and she's and Jonathan... She says, you know, he's so perfect. He's just, he's Jonathan. He's exactly what he's supposed to be, you know? And he, yeah, no, it's, 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 I, I think it's so liberating. Yeah. 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 I think we've been trying to fit ourselves into little boxes for so long. Yeah. Uh, you have honored the importance, excuse me, of theory. And theory gives us a point of view. Another point of view that the lady in front of me here is uh, reference is the age of Aquarius or astrology, specifically mundane, or the astrology of the planet. And there's pretty good evidence uh, that correlates between the uh, cycle of, or the synodic cycle of Pluto and Neptune, and major historical shifts in especially European uh, history of around 500-year segments. 
Mm -hmm. okay. And so in the 1892 or three, somewhere in there, uh, Neptune and Pluto uh, completed the cycle. They came back to the same place. They were conjunct, as it says. So that starts a new roughly 500-year cycle. And that cycle follows uh, the typical uh, lunar cycle uh, in the sense that uh, you start out with the dark and the, the first eighth of that cycle is, is germination. And then after, as you move into the second eighth of the cycle toward the quarter, you start to see what's, what's sprouting. Well, we're 125 years, 120 some years into this next cycle. So that from that point of view, hmm. What is now sprouting, uh, or yet to sprout? Yeah, it's a period of confusion. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you know, for my part, I know what I want to see uh, grow. I know what's the harvest, what's the edible crop, and what it needs. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure that we know which yeah. is which. Right. And just to pick up on what's been said here today, uh, yeah, it's really. Uh, I've been thinking about this in another way of a cartoon that I can't draw mm -hmm. but all the people uh, standing in the light casting a shadow and behind them all their individual shadows merge into one huge cultural uh, shadow yeah. so it's really up to each of us you know, yeah. uh, as much as possible and the influence that we have on each other and then places like this where people can come and mm -hmm. talk about these things yeah yeah Yeah, <clears throat> for me, one of the one of the ways to that I, in my own work, try to get at shadow is to you know think about what is my ego ideal, and then whatever the opposite of that is, you know, is, you know, it's part of your shadow, and then to try to find the gold in that, to try to find a way to redeem those things, you know, and try to find a way also for the the ideal things to become maybe a little, uh, to find the shadow in those things, you know? So, so it, it's, it's trying to integrate from both sides. Yeah. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to the 2020 donors who gave at the supporting member level and above. Barbara Anand, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie K. Bryan, Eric Cooper, Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, George J. Didier, James Fidelibus, John Korolewski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Cobb, Gerald Weiner, Karen West, and James Taylor, and Ellen Young. And thank you to everybody else who gave at that level but wishes to remain anonymous.